it's something like 75% of all songs that have been written have been written about love. <laughs> um, and I had some great lines. And if I could have found it quickly, I would have read you. The Beatles, that one I remember, they said all you need is love. And they're right. But it's a matter of what love they're talking about. And it's a little bit more than what most of the songs are written about. It's more than love me tender, love me true. It's more than most of the love songs and most of the books and movies that have been written about love. And as wonderful as love is, and that kind of love is, there's something even greater. But we're going to look tonight at the different words, a couple of the different words that are used in the word God for the word love. The Greeks had a word for it. You ever hear that expression? Well, it's certainly true when it comes to love. The Greeks had a number of different words for it. And you can break it down to really just four main ones. The first one, the one that we won't be looking at tonight, perhaps to some people's disappointment, is eros. Um, that is just a physical sexual love. Another word that's used is philos, and it's different forms, and there's a number of different forms, so we're getting into that. Another word that the Greeks had is agape, or agapeo. One is the noun, the other one is the verb. And that's another one that the word of God speaks about extensively, and we will be looking at that. And the other one is stor storge, but we won't be getting into that in much detail. I think one verse may have that in it. These different words for love are all significant, and they're used with a real exactness in the Word of God. Did I tell you 1 Peter chapter 1? Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Okay. It's good because I was looking at second. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. The way that reads in the King James Version sort of doesn't make a lot of sense. It says, Seeing that you have purified yourself unto unfeigned love, see that ye love with a pure heart fervently. It sounds kind of like you're being told to do something you're already doing. It's like my saying, seeing that you are eating, if I said no, seeing that you are eating all your food, eat all your food. You say, I'm eating, why are you telling me that? Or if I said, seeing that you're working so hard, work hard. Well, why do you need to tell me that? I'm already doing it. If you read it just in the King James Version, it seems like that's what we're being exhorted to do. Seeing that you have purified your souls into obeying the truth and the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. But the reality, the greatness of that is missed by simply looking at the English, because in the Greek there are two different words that are used there. The first one, the first word that's used when it says unfeigned love of the brethren, is the word Philadelphia. Yeah. Jerry always gets excited because he's from Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. We'll be talking about Philadelphia quite a bit tonight, Jerry, so that'll make you real happy. <laughs> Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. Did you find that to be the case, Jerry? Uh, ironically enough, yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what it was, that's what <laughs> they endeavored to live up to with their name, and that's what it means, literally. Philadelphia literally means brotherly love. And it's used quite a number of times in the Bible. Brotherly love, Philadelphia. The second word where it says, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently is the Greek word agape. And that word doesn't mean brotherly love. It means the love of God. The love of God and really in its fullness, which hopefully we'll get to, is the love of God in the renewed mind in manifestation. That love is something that does not appear in the Word of God until the New Testament. 
it's a love that wasn't even available really until the time of the new birth. It's a love that Jesus Christ taught about and becomes available in its fullness after the day of Pentecost. Turn to Romans chapter 12. You see, these two different words, and we're going to look at both of these, Philadelphia and agape, or agapeo, they describe two different kinds of love. The first one, this brotherly love, is an emotion-based love. It's a conditional love. It's a love that's very good, but it is a kind of love that you have for some people and not necessarily for others. It's that kind of love that you would talk about with a close friend. Somebody that you care for, somebody that you love, but it's that human emotion-based love. And there's different forms, as I said, Philadelphia comes from another word, phylos or phileo, and those words are always descriptive of an emotional human love. That can be a very wonderful thing. It can be a very wonderful thing. And it's what the songs are written about. But like the song says, love hurts. That kind of love can hurt. That kind of love can be not returned. That kind of love can be very self-focused. The guy who sings about love me tender, love me true, he's looking for his needs being met. He's not looking so much for what he's giving, but what he's receiving. And it's very conditional. You know, Al was saying about that, you know, to some pretty girl. He wasn't singing about that to the Memphis Mafia. There was based on things that attracted him. That's that kind of love. And whether we're talking about it in the romantic context or whether we're just talking about it in the context of friendship, it's still conditional. You love somebody because of certain things. I love this about you. I love that about you. I love the way you do this. I love the way you look. I love your caring, your compassion. I love your intelligence. All of these different conditions that are behind that love. And again, there's nothing wrong with that per se, but just understand that love is not unconditional. Agape is an unconditional love, and it's the only true unconditional love. People use that term erroneously so often nowadays. They talk about unconditional love when really they're speaking about a love that's based upon condition. You know, I always like the example of dogs love unconditionally. Really? It has nothing to do with the fact that you took this dog in and that you've given him a good home and that you care for him and that you showered all this affection on He just loved you unconditionally. No, that's not true. The reason why that dog loves you is because of all of those things that you've done for that dog. Tristan is learning to love Angela because Angela loves Tristan. And she's a wonderful mother and she loves him and holds him and cares for him and takes care of him and feeds him. And all of that will bring about the natural response of that baby loving her in return. And that's a wonderful love, but there is that condition, that relationship that that's built upon. But the love of God is truly unconditional. And we'll see this as we go into it more. We're going to tell you Romans chapter 12. Mm -hmm. Romans 12 we once again see the two different kinds of love expressed in this verse. Romans 12 and in verse 9. Let love, that first word is agape, the unconditional love. Let love be without dissimulation, hypocrisy, without preferring one over another. And for that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. There, we have again brotherly love, 
Again, coming from that word, Philadelphia. We're exhorted to have both. It's not that Philadelphia is wrong. I don't know about the city. <laughs> not that the brotherly love is wrong. It's not that there's anything wrong with Philadelphia. We're encouraged to have that kind of love as well. Be kindly affection toward one another with brotherly love. God wants us to do that. He wants us to develop those friendships, to get to know each other, to have that kind of real affection that comes as you do build a relationship. But he also wants us to love with that love of God. He wants us to love not just those people that you might choose to make friends, not just those people that you sort of naturally would hit it off with, but he wants us to love everyone unconditionally, without limit. That's the love of God. We won't go there, but in Hebrews 13.1, it again says, let brotherly love continue. There again, we're exhorted to have that brotherly love, to continue to, to use it. We will look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where again we see the two compared one to another, Philadelphia and Agape. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 9. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you. For ye yourselves are taught of God to love, agape, one another. As touching Philadelphia, brotherly love, there's no need that I write unto you because you're taught also to have the love of God, that agape. You see, as wonderful as phileo or Philadelphia love is, the agapeo form is even greater. It's an even greater love. Love is wonderful. Philadelphia, that brotherly love is wonderful. Phileo love, the love of a parent for a child and a child for a parent, one friend for another. All of that is wonderful, but the agapeo is even greater because it is that love of God, that love of God. It's that love that we've been given and continue, exhorted to use by Jesus Christ. One more on brotherly love here, and the love of God before we go into agape more. Second Peter chapter 1. Hebrews, James, Second Peter. Chapter 1. And it's going to be verse 7, but I want to give you a little context here because this is appears in a list of virtues that begins in verse 5. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith, or believing, virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, or self-control, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, that's Philadelphia again, and to brotherly kindness, Philadelphia, add to that charity, which is agape, the love of God. There's a progression here. And it talks about things that we should strive to have in our lives, virtues that we should cultivate. And as we go through this progression, we reach toward the end there, brotherly love, and then add to that agape, agape. That love of God, add to that Add that to everything else. Because the love of God, again, is the greatest. In John chapter 13, we see that Jesus Christ is the one that introduced this love of God to the world. John chapter 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, this is Jesus speaking, a new commandment, they've had lots of other commandments before, this one's a new one, that ye love one another, that's agape. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. 
In all cases, it's actually the verb form of gapeo. We are to love one another, just as Jesus Christ loved us. And that's the new commandment that he gave, this commandment of love. This commandment of love that when we follow it, then all the other commandments just kind of fall into place. Look at Luke chapter 6. Here again, Jesus speaks about this agape form of love, and he describes it and gives us more of an idea of what it's all about. John 13. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. We already did John 13. Luke chapter 6. And we'll pick it up in verse... Oh, verse 31. As ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have you? For sinners also love them who those that love them. Jesus said that we should love not just those that love us, because anybody can do that. Anybody can love those that love them. And that's, again, philip. Somebody loves you, it's easy to love them back. But here, we're encouraged to not just love those that love us, but to love everyone. Verse 33. And if you do good to them, which do good to you, what thank have you? You know, why should you be, be patted on the back? For sinners also do even the same. And if you lend to them of whom you hope to receive, what thank have you? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again, and interest. But, verse 35, love ye your enemies. Love what? Your, your enemies. enemies. Okay. That's outside of the category of philo. That's, that's not loving people that are good to you. Love ye your enemies. Not just the people you like, not just the people that are nice to you, but love ye your enemies. I got that. And lend hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he, God, is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. God is kind to even the unthankful and even the evil. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever should believe on him should not perish but have everlasting life. God did that at the time, it says in Romans, that the world was at enmity with him. And the world was at, at loggerheads when they were enemies of God. He gave his only begotten Son. And now God encourages us to love all, to love even our enemies. Well, how can you do that? How can you love even your enemies? Because we have this love of God as part of what we gain at the time of the new birth. At the time a person confesses Jesus Christ as Lord and believes that God raised him from the dead, according to the Bible, they're saved. And they receive the gift of Holy Spirit. And that contains a lot. It contains the ability to operate in manifestations like we did today. It contains the nature of God. It is Holy Spirit. That's the nature of God. And it gives us the ability to love with that unconditional love. Without it, you can't truly love unconditionally. It may look like it to people, and some people may be fooled by it. But in order to really love with that perfect spiritual love, unconditional, limitless love, it requires that we have the nature of God. There's a lot in the Word of God that talks about that a, only a good tree can produce good fruit, a corrupt tree can only produce corrupt fruit. That by a, the fruit, you know what kind of tree it is. You know, an apple tree will produce apples. And if it's really an apple tree, that's all it will produce. I say that because we have a tree in our backyard that's a plum tree, but when we bought it, it claimed to be a pear tree. So. <laughs> now, there's no question, no matter what you say, no matter what Lowe's put on the tag, no question that it is <laughs> a plum tree. We know by the fruit. And true love of God can only happen when the nature behind it is the nature of God. Look at chapter... 13 of Romans. Mm 
Again, looking at this love of God and understanding greater what it is and how it is the fulfillment of all the rest of the commandments. We'll pick up in verse 8. Romans 13, 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. Recognize those commandments? Yeah. Part of the ten. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. When we have the love of God, we're not going to be breaking the other laws. If you love someone, you're not going to steal from them. If you love someone, you're not going to lie to them. If you love somebody, you're not going to kill them. With love, all the rest is fulfilled. And that's why on that love of God, on, you know, Jesus Christ said love Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. If you're walking with that love toward God and toward your fellow man, then the rest just kind of falls into place. But that love is the fulfillment of all the rest, and it is above all the rest. Look at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5. The Word of God speaks about this love of God all throughout the church epistles. And we're not even beginning to scratch the surface that's there. We could go on for many weeks on the love of God and still just really begin to cover it. But this is just an introduction to the love of God and that love being the greatest of all loves. In Galatians chapter 5, and in verse 13, we read, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. We have been called unto a life of liberty or freedom. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Here in Galatians, <clears throat> it's dealing with the matter of the law. And the Galatians, even though they were freed from the law by what Jesus Christ accomplished, we have been freed from the law by Jesus Christ fulfilling it, that they still continued to put themselves under law. And he's teaching them and showing them that they're not under law and that they have the freedom to do what they want. Now, the question people always have when they begin to be told that is, you mean I can go out and you know, sin and still do wrong things and God still will accept me into heaven? Yes, you can. And the Word of God makes that abundantly clear. In Romans, and Galatians, and Ephesians, all these places... Make it as clear as can be. Is that what God would want us to do, though? Mm -hmm. We have the choice. And God loved us so big that when we understand the depth of that love, we don't use that choice, that freedom, that liberty as an occasion to the flesh. We don't use it to just waste it away our lives on serving the flesh. But just like that baby learns to love and in turn loves back, the more we understand God's love, the more our response is, is to love back. The more we love God back, the more we love his people. The more we understand the depth of God's love, the greater our love for others becomes. And finish it today. Verse 15. But if you bite and devour one another, Take heed that you be not consumed one of another. If you choose to go by the occasion of the flesh, then you know, you're just going to end up biting and devouring and consuming one another. Down in verse 22, and this is where we'll close. Before that, 
right before verse 22, it lists all the things that are the works of the flesh, all the things that those that do not have love would do. And then in verse 22, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. That's the fruit of the Spirit. A moment ago I talked about fruit. An apple tree produces apples. For those that are born of God's Spirit and get to the point where they know what they have, begin to put that Word of God on in their mind and live it, then they produce that fruit of the Spirit. As we use the Spirit that we've been given, as we put God's Word on to learn who we are, what God's made us to be and what His will is, then we begin to walk with God and we produce that fruit, which includes that love of God. All right. Thank you.